Our guest today is J. H. Baker, the former president of Coles. Mr. Baker, thank you so much for joining us today. You're very welcome. So when you go public, uh, how does that change? How did that change Coles? Uh, and, and how did uh, that create new challenges that you had to address? Well, let's start first. On the plus side, it gave us the opportunity, access the cash, to start to build new stores. And then as we got bigger, we generated our own cash. So that helped us to this expansion that you asked about. The other thing people said, wow, it's really tough when you go public. And I think today it's tougher than it was when we went. But you've got to report numbers. Naturally, you, you know, you're, we used to have to report every month and then, of course, quarterly. And, you, you know, uh, they're very tough. If you miss, you know, uh, by a penny your estimate, they could kill your stock. And, you know, it's a crazy world. But, uh, but I said this. So somebody said, must be really tough being public. I said, you know what's tougher? When we were highly leveraged, and a bank, you know, had our debt, they could have just gone with a spigot and turned it off and said, you know, we're, we're not giving you any more money. That's tough. Uh, going public was much easier. Mm -hmm. The three of us sat down. It's very interesting. And, you know, going public, you know, you have to make numbers. You have to, but we, we sat down and said, we're just going to run this company the right way. Mm -hmm. And, and we certainly have a great allegiance to people who buy our stock, but the biggest allegiance is to our own employees. Yes. And we got to make sure that we're going to run the company right, not make any short-term things that will hurt us long-term. And we really adhered to that. I'm not saying we didn't want to make our numbers. And I could tell you something I'm really proud. In 14 years, we never missed a quarter. Wow. I mean, we have might have had a, a down month, but we never had a down quarter in 14 years. So I'm kind of proud yeah. of that. Part of that is because we had a lot of growth, and that helped us a lot. And the other thing, I think we just had a great concept. And uh, in the 90s, we might have been the hottest retailer in America. Uh, and we started building first 10 stores, 15, and then we got up to 100 stores a year. And, uh, and we, we never had this vision that we're going to be a national retailer. I think if you have that vision, you, when you start, you start to add too many people. You start to do maybe some crazy things. We just went step by step. We just wanted to be, we're not going to be the biggest. We just wanted to be one of the best retailers. We wanted to make money, and we wanted to be successful. That was it. And, and, and we didn't have this vision that we had to go, but we kept going. And, you know, we went into Chicago, very successful. Detroit, very successful. Minneapolis. Then we went into other areas, went to Texas, went to L.A. Then we went east. We went to Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, and then we go to New York. And, and it worked. So all of a sudden, we're looking at ourselves, and we're nearly a national company, and we never dreamed, you know, and then, uh, but it happened. And, and today, I mean, we're proud that today we're just short of 1,200 stores, and we're $19 billion. I have a T-shirt from 1986 at the 164th largest department store. One of the buyers <laughs> gave it to all of us. So today there's probably, what, 20 or 30 department stores, and we're number two after Macy's. We're 19 billion. We were a little behind pennies until, unfortunately, uh, uh, they had one of the worst years in the history of retailing. They're about 14 billion now. So we're the second biggest uh, retailer in, sure. uh, you know, after Macy's. And Macy's bought May Company to be that big. So uh, that's pretty amazing, that's and uh, we're kind of proud of that, and, uh, and we're continuing to be, you know, I think a wonderful store. We all retired in 2000, got off, I got off the board in six or seven, and they just got off the board this year, they're a little younger. My protege actually runs it now, and uh, Kevin Mansell, and, you know, we're proud that when we left, we were eight or nine billion, and now we're 19 billion. So. I think we left the foundation that's very exciting. That's, that's remarkable. Uh, let me ask, take you back to the 1990s to ask a question. Uh, uh, you went public, but the other big thing that happened in the 1990s is that the internet came along and e-commerce came along. Well, it really wasn't big at that time, just starting. 1995, 96. Yeah, but it really but more in the 2000s. Your, as, as a fast-growing brick-and-mortar retailer, what was your first reaction to the arrival of e-commerce? Was it to dismiss it as a passing fad, or did you think that it's going to become Well, to be honest, when we, 
while the time we ran it up until 2000, the internet didn't have much, you know, there wasn't much in it. Uh, what we did spend a lot of money is improving all our systems so that we automated so many things, uh, uh, both in-store experiences at the register, uh, our, all our buying systems, you know, all our allocations. So we spent a lot of money. We believe very strongly in, in, in being ahead of the curve and not. This was just starting, and, I, and it really more as we were on the board, and we were very vocal, I can tell you this, how important this was going to be. Right. And that initially, like it didn't report to the president, to Kevin, right? And I said, that's the biggest mistake in the world. This is mm -hmm. going to be your biggest growth vehicle. Mm -hmm. It's going to explode. That's what's going to happen. I can't tell you how big it's going to be, but it's going to be incredibly important. And uh, they were a little slow in getting into it, but then he took it over. And they've really, you know, today, uh, you know, they're as the other retailers. I think a lot of the brick and mortar retailers were slow in doing it. They saw it, but I don't think they realized how big it was going to be, how right. important it was going to be. How, to give you an example, when I ran Kohl's uh, with my partners, 75% of our advertising was newspaper, and then their 25% was television or radio. That was it. Today, a newspaper, and I'm not exactly sure, the last time I spoke to Kevin was under 40%, okay, and dropping. Mm -hmm. And radio and television, you know, again, changed because you got 80 million television stations before you could zero in pretty yeah. easily. Right. And this whole social networking, Omnicom, this whole internet is so big today. Yeah. And I think it's still a big problem for, uh, for our industry. I think everybody knows it's important. Everybody's putting a lot of money into it. Uh, they're finding out that it costs more to do that than it does to sell from the stores. So the profit margins are a little different. It's something that I, I want to take a look at and try and maybe with the Baker Retail Center and things, could we study this a little bit more? How do we become more efficient? How does it work better? What percent of the business? What's the growth? You know, I think there's a lot of questions there. I mean, all of a sudden you have a company named Amazon yeah. has come on. They're like a giant retailer, and they're able to do all this and not make any money, you know, because they reinvest the money, and people say it's fine. And the stock, I mean, last year they had a little blip because they didn't do as well, but the point is they don't make much money. If a retailer did that, the stock would be down to zero. You know, if you miss by a penny, you, you could lose 10%. They've been able to do this because they're taking such market share and people believe one day, I mean, they'll own the world. So I, I think what's happening naturally, there are other people doing things like that. There's new companies coming out to compete with them. Plus every brick and mortar place understands it's part of the business. And instead of brick and mortar being a disadvantage, the combination of being able to use the internet, you can ship from stores, you can also return in the stores. And so the combination is something that can work very well as long as you understand it. And, and, and one of the big problems too, with advertising, when you ran in newspapers, you know, you, you knew where your circulation, who you were hitting and at the time. And, and so, you know, you know how many pieces you sold and you really had, you could see if the advertising was working, not working, the items were good or bad. Now so much of it, you're advertising in a way you're not really getting the results immediately. They'll come and it'll be cumulative, but it's a little trickier. So I think for everybody, um, it, it's a more, it's a complicated thing, but it's also change, you know? And the people who are going to be around, you look at retailers, how many are gone, because whoever the leadership were didn't change with the times. And I think the retailers who are changing and adapting to what's new and what customers want, you got one thing, I think, in retailing. It's never changed. You got to take care of the customer. So it starts with the merchandise. You have the great merchandise. You got to have an environment where they want to shop. And you got to find out how they want to shop. And if they want to shop, you know, with a telephone, if they want to shop, you know, with the computer, if they want to shop online, however they want to shop, you want to be there. And the younger generation, I, I was just in some classes, you know, talking to a lot of students. How many read newspapers? 
one hand goes up, you know. That's not what they do today. You know, we grew up reading newspapers. They're not. So long as we understand what is this generation, because this is the generation and, and the generation above them, and the generations coming up, that's your customer, right? So you've got to be able to take care of them. So I think, you know, you've got to be on top of this. So it, it also makes people who are running companies today to be more broad-based, you know, the merchant prince of yesterday, maybe, of the, this great store guy, you know, or a young lady. Today, you've got to be more well-rounded and understand more things, but that's okay. That's what the business is. And you've got to be open-minded, willing to change. And uh, the guys and girls that do that are going to be very successful. The other ones will be like all the companies, the 130 department stores that don't exist today. <laughs> so just a couple of last questions. If you think back on your, you spent your whole life in retail, uh, think back on your career, what would you say is the biggest leadership challenge that you ever faced? And how did you deal with it and what did you learn from it? I think, uh, I'm trying to think the greatest, uh, one of the problems you always have as you kind of get promoted, and let's say in my early career, then I'll go to maybe Kohl's, you know, when I became, uh, say, a divisional merchandise manager at GMM, I always felt, you know, I was a great buyer, you know, I understood and I could be the best at that. And then when you move up, you now have, say, six buyers reporting to you, or a GMM, you've got half a store reporting to you. You then don't have to be the best buyer. What you have to be is the best manager of people and understanding how to get people working well together and looking at, at the picture, the, the big picture, and you know how do you find the businesses that you want to invest in, but then you gotta give them the authority and responsibility to do the job. And that takes time to learn. And initially, that's a tricky thing to learn. Walking into Kohl's, I mean, here's, we understood Kohl's, but it was kind of a shambles when we took it home. You know, it was doing poorly. It was losing money, you know, wasn't gaining market share, wasn't doing anything. So I, I, I think, you know, when you stand there, you look at, wow, this is, this is something. And here, the three of us, you know, uh, we had to invest our own money. So we had our, you know, we had to borrow money because we weren't all wealthy guys, you know, and we had to borrow money to invest in it. So here we are with borrowed money, you know, with a company that's kind of really tough. And yeah, you sit there and, you know, you shake a little bit and, and you don't have all the greatest people initially. And yet you've just got to sit down and, and God and say, what do we want this company to be? You know, and we spent quite a lot of times, I said, we use the outside service. And, and what I'm kind of proud of, we, we wrote like a half page thing, what Kohl's is. And today, uh, Kevin sent me a manual that they give to all the employees. It starts with that same damn page, you know, from 1986. I mean, the company's changed a lot, a lot of exciting things, but that same principle is what it is today. And we had to do that and stick to that, you know, and, and that's tricky. You know, because things happen and you change and you don't want to waver. I mean, you, you do things to make it work, but you stay with what you believe, you know. I think that's uh, not the easiest thing to do, especially, you know, when you're, you're a highly leveraged company yeah. and, you know, you could go out of business tomorrow. Right. And I think that was one of the toughest things we had is how do you manage all that, you know? Uh, how do you take that focus away from you that you've got this highly leveraged and just focus on how do you get the business to work, you know? And how do you make it work, a business that's not working? But we had a lot of confidence. We were very fortunate. I told you my background, Bill and John had similar wonderful backgrounds. So we had three really seasoned people who got along very well. They're still like my brothers. We still yeah. are very friendly. You hear partners that don't talk. We just get along very well. So again, you take three personalities very different, and how do you make them work? And we all have different skills, and how do you make that work that you don't step on your toes and stuff? That's all tricky, you know, because we never did that before. All of a sudden, the buck stops here, you know? Before, we always worked for somebody, and there was always somebody else making the ultimate decision. Now you're making all the decisions. It's a big change. I think what was fortunate that we felt we were ready to do it, you know, and, 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 but, but I can't tell you that you don't have sleepless nights at times about it. 
And maybe one of the toughest times we ever had that maybe was one of the things that really shaped Coles. Uh, 1987, we had like a mini recession. We're just one year into this whole thing, right? Still very leveraged, you know, because we actually paid it off, but it was the next year. And uh, everything looks like Christmas is could be a disaster, you know, because we're in this mini recession, or maybe bigger than a mini recession. And I remember going home and thinking, what the hell do we do? And I called Bill and John at home. I said, let's meet at 6 o'clock tomorrow morning, and let's talk. And so the three of us sat down, and we said, we have two choices. One is this hunker down, you know, and, and just ride it out and try and survive, or let's do something dramatic. And, and, and I came up with a plan with them that uh, we would lower our prices, make ourselves super competitive, would put more marketing dollars out there, and every marketing extra dollar had to be saved by expenses. So we had to get the whole company to sit down and say, we're going to cut this amount of dollars in expenses. We're going to put it into marketing, but all rock em and sock em marketing. And we're going to lower our prices, and we're going to bring in, you know, enough goods, really, put it in. But, you know, we had some wonderful vendor relationships where we maybe had our backside covered a little bit. We didn't, you know, totally. And we said, we're just going to go for it. But with protection, we had a 16% Christmas that year, probably better than any other retail. We were very small, but doing that gave us such confidence. And it also showed, like, if we really step out there, but with good thought, you know, we, we protected ourselves with expenses, protected ourselves with vendors, but it worked. And, uh, and that was a big turning point for us, and we, we started getting this momentum. But that was a tough decision to make, because if it didn't work, I mean, we were protected, but you're never 100% protected. So these are some of the things we remember uh, as, as uh, special things in, 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 in the career of Coles. Let me ask you one last question. How do you define success? Well, that's interesting. I, I, uh, I guess if I look at my career, you know, I, for many years, you know, I worked for, other, for companies, worked my way up. So success, I'll tell you, when I was just starting, I'll tell you what I made at Macy's. I mean, I made 3200 a year. And they said, don't tell anybody because you're from Wharton and we pay you a little more. I didn't tell anybody because all my friends are making more <laughs> money, you know. And, and so I, I said in life, boy, if I can make 10000 you know, at that time, I'll be doing good. Then I made 10000 didn't mean anything, you know, because half of, half of what I made different went into taxes, you know, or, or whatever, and it didn't change my lifestyle. So I think it's uh, success is having satisfaction, doing something that you have passion for and that you end up, whatever that is, that you do well at it and, and you have satisfaction that, that you had a successful career whenever you chose. None of us thought about making a lot of money. Making money is wonderful, but that was always over here someplace. That, like, if we could have made coal successful, we'll do well, right? But the satisfaction of taking this little company and making it, you know, we never dreamed it'd be 19 billion, I'll tell you. Somebody said, you dreamed that. I said, are you kidding me? I would have passed out, you know? <laughs> <laughs> we wanted to make the next day, you know? And then we'd go from here to here. It was a building block. But it was doing something you loved, that you had passion for, and you made something happen. And it might be being an artist, doing a great painting, you know, uh, being a school teacher that, that has these kids all go to college, you know, or whatever it is, but something that, that you have a goal for and you achieve it. Uh, if at one part of it you make money, that's great, you know. Uh, I, I don't think that was ever the motivator, but you're happy as hell to have it, you know, and, and it's changed my whole life because I have this money and, and, 
And it's also as I retired, you know, I always had a lot of energy and what do you do? And one of the things my wife, we both grew up middle class and uh, my parents, I mean, sent me to Wharton, but I worked, uh, you know, summers, I worked after school, we didn't have the money. I always kid, you have a lot of people with, you know, silver spoons and I had a lead pipe, but I didn't really, <laughs> you know, but I wasn't a wealthy kid. Uh, but I was so happy that I, that I went to Wharton and it's always been. And so when we, you know, retired, what was I gonna do? Somebody said, you know, you'll go have a lot of energy, you go to work. I said, I'm not gonna work eight days a week anymore and you're not gonna build another Coles, you know. And so we decided to like give back. We've been so fortunate and we've got involved in a lot of charitable things. And of course, one of my most favorite is being involved at, at Wharton, you know, I love it and the retail center and the students and it's just all good. But it is such a wonderful feeling that we're able to give back and do things. And we want to do it in our lifetime. You know, a lot of the old days, you know, you'd have a foundation and when you died, you know, they'd give the money. I'm sure there'll be something left, but it's nice to do it when you're alive and to be involved in it and see it happening. And it's our choices and it isn't somebody else's choices. And so I think that's, you know, all the success I, I think I can look back and here we got this $19 billion company that's still there and it's still doing well. And we employ all these thousands of people and we helped a lot of people be pretty successful. I think that's a wonderful feeling of success. And that today, because we were successful, we can give back and help other people. And it's a wonderful feeling and uh, we're proud, you know, I'm really proud to do that. Thank you so much for speaking with Knowledge at Wharton. <laughs> You're very welcome. Thank you.